let me introduce our uh, introduce our today's speaker, uh, Professor Alexander Martin from Notre Dame University. And Professor Martin is an accomplished and one of the most prominent Russian historians. So I won't list all of his accomplishments to allow him enough time to talk today. But uh, let me just highlight the most important things. Um, Professor Martin is a specialist in Russian imperial history between the 18th century, the mid-18th century, and the, and the end of the 19th century. His first book, Romantics, Reformers, Reactionaries, Russian Conservative Thought and Politics in the Reign of Alexander I, um, examined not only the conservative thought of that time, but actually the genesis of a modern Russian conservative, uh, conservative um, and national uh, conser uh, conservatism and nationalism. Uh, Professor Martin's current book, Enlightened Metropolis: Constructing Imperial Moscow from 1762, the beginning of Catherine II reign, to 1855, the end of Nicholas I reign, is forthcoming. It will be published uh, in the spring. Um, and um, it examines the transformation of Moscow into a modern city uh, from the perspective of social history, intellectual history, and development of urban planning and institutions. I should say that Professor Martin wrote a number of um, articles. They are part of uh, collections of articles and a number of, uh, publi uh, a number of publications in peer-reviewed journals. And many of them made their way to our to syllabi of most courses of most graduate and undergraduate courses uh, on Russia, Russian history, Russian intellectual history, and even Russian literature. Uh, Professor Martin also is one of the editors of the leading journal in Russian uh, history, Kritika, Explorations of Russian and Eurasian History. Um, so, but before uh, we will um, welcome Professor Martin. Let me tell you a few words about our next events. For the next two weeks, uh, we, will, we, we won't have Chris Noon lectures on Wednesdays, but instead we will ho host several distinguished vi uh, visitors in the evening times to make to make it more accessible, to make it possible for, m for more people to come. Uh, next Wednesday, October the 10th, filmmaker Agnieszka Holland will visit us for the annual Copernicus Lecture, and it's entitled uh, Filmmaker's Approach to Society's Most Vaccine Concerns. Um, it will take place at 5 p.m. at the Michigan Theater, and it will be followed by a screening of her recent film In Darkness. On October 17th, Pavel Khodorkovsky, son of Mikhail Khodorkovsky, in jailed Russian businessman, will present the lecture Trade in Your Human Rights, A Path to Sovereign Democracy. This will take place at 4 p.m. at the Hatcher Graduate Library, Room 100. And now, please join me welcoming Professor Martin to uh, Greece and to the University of Michigan. Well, thank you very much for this very nice introduction. And I'm, it's a pleasure for me to get to be here today and, and talk to you all. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you about is the arguments that developed my forthcoming book. Please do not take this as a reason not to buy the book. <laughs> it co it'll come out with Oxford. It sells for a low, low $120 or something like that. <laughs> so it's the ideal stocking stuffer for Christmas next year. Um, yeah, what I'd like to talk to you about is the, the modernization of Moscow in the 18th, first from the second half of the 18th through the first half of the 19th century. Um, it, I'm sure all of you who are familiar with 19th century Russian culture 
are familiar with the idea that Petersburg was the modern, Western-oriented, European, Russian, Russian metropolis, and Moscow was the traditional Russian Orthodox metropolis, and that Russians looked at this Russianness of Moscow with a certain pride or at least affection. And the argument that I want to make is that for a long time that was not the case. That is, for the entire period, certainly, that I'm describing in, in my talk, the outlook of the Russian state and of much of the Russian elite was that Moscow's traditionalism was a problem. It was a source of backwardness. It was a threat to the integrity of Russian society. And so one of the larger goals of the Russian regime was to transform Moscow into what, in this book, I call an enlightened metropolis. Now, metropolis is my translation for the Russian stalitsa. The Russians referred to Moscow as a stalitsa. And as, in this case, it's obviously not the capital in the English sense. I think metropolis captures the term better of what Moscow represented. And what I mean by enlightened is a city that embraces and represents the, the, the principles of the enlightenment in the 18th century sense. So, so what I want to argue is that the, the Russian regime for much of the later 18th and early 19th century was trying to turn Moscow into a city that would lend itself to being a platform for disseminating enlightened values in the Russian heartland. The, 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 the way that the regime tried to do this, and you'll see me switching glasses back and forth because I have distance glasses and reading glasses, and in a situation like this, neither of them really works. So, but what I'm going to argue is that the, the regime had a three-pronged strategy for carrying out this transformation. One strategy is something that I've taken to calling the imperial social project. I don't know if that's a great expression, but that's what I've stuck with. What I mean by the imperial social project is taking the various middling strata of Russian society and unifying them into a single middle stratum that would embrace the values of the imperial regime. So this, is, this social project is imperial not in the sense of the multi-ethnic empire, but in the sense of a connection with the values of the imperial state. So the imperial social project is one prong of the strategy for turning Moscow into an enlightened metropolis. The second prong of the strategy is, or what follows rather from this imperial social project, is to create a, this, this European-oriented middle class, in effect, required an urban environment in which that kind of class could, could prosper. So Moscow's ur physical and infrastructural environment had to be transformed, and that's the second prong of the strategy. Right? The first prong is, social, is the social project, the second prong is the urban environment. The third element, then, is that Moscow had to be rebranded. I guess that's the term that the, the, the public relations people would use. Moscow's image had to be changed. Because as long as, be, because if Moscow, if, if, if both Russians and Europeans could be persuaded that Moscow was an enlightened European metropolis, that would be proof of the success of the civilizing project of the imperial regime. So it was very important to create a new image for the city aside from transforming the reality. There's an overall, ar th th my argument is that this strategy was pursued with relatively little change from the beginning of Catherine II's reign until the death of Nicholas I. That's what creates the, the chronological parameters. There's, there's no fundamental shift during those 90 plus years. But there's a kind of arc to this story. And the arc is that the, the overall transformation of Moscow you know, gets underway under Catherine. It achieves great successes in the era of Alexander I. And under Nicholas I, it stagnates and fails. So this is a story of rise and fall that runs rise under Catherine, success under Alexander, decline under Nicholas. So let me start with Catherine the Great. It's important, Catherine is kind of where the story starts. And it's important to understand how deeply Catherine hated Moscow. Um, Catherine wrote at one point, probably in, the, in 1771, she wrote that, and she's writing here about the Moscow nobility. Right? Everything annoyed her about Moscow. It was a dirty place, it was backward, it was nasty, it was uncivilized. At one point she writes about the Moscow nobility. She says that Moscow is a huge city, it's the seat of sloth. It's a place where, I quote, where the nobles learn to assume the tone and allurements of laziness and luxury. They become effeminate, always driving around with a coach and six horses. 
and they see only sorry sights capable of enfeebling the most remarkable genius. Furthermore, never has a people, now here she's talking about Moscow as a whole, never has a people held before its eyes more objects of fanaticism. And remember, fanaticism in the 18th century sense means a kind of dangerous primitive irrationality, usually with religious overtones. So never has a people beheld before its eyes more objects of fanaticism, such as miraculous icons at every step, priests, convents, pilgrims, beggars, thieves, useless servants in the noble houses. And what houses those are, what disorder there is in the noble houses, where the lots are immense and the courtyards are filthy swamps. Usually each noble has not merely a house, but a small estate in the city. In those houses, you have that rabble of a motley crowd, always ready to oppose good order, which from time, to, for which from time immemorial has rioted at the least pretext. Catherine goes on to decry, quote, the manufactories of immense size, which have been built there imprudently, and at which there is an excessive number of workmen. And she complains about, quote, the villages that are presently intermingled with the city and where no police rule, but which give asylum to thieves and crimes and criminals. In 40 years, Petersburg has given more circulation to money and industry in the empire than Moscow has in the 500 years since it was built. The people in St. Petersburg are more docile, more polite, less superstitious, more accustomed to foreigners from whom they continually acquire one fashion or another, and so on. So this is, this is Catherine's outlook, right? And I think I've, I've read this at some length, but I wanted to convey how intense her hostility to the city was and to what an extent she sees Moscow as the embodiment of everything about Russia that is backward. Now, why did Catherine and her successors want to transform Moscow, aside from this visceral disliking? Right? And I would argue that there are two broad reasons why, um, why they want to transform them. I was originally going to say three reasons. But last semester, my students started getting on my case because everything, all my lectures always involve three reasons for everything. In fact, at the end of my Western Civ class last semester, I got this sort of, this little medal as a reward from them. It was a little cheap old plastic thing. And on it, somebody had typed the reasons why they gave me the medal. And one reason was that I always give three reasons for everything. <laughs> so that's why now there's only two reasons. But one reason has two sub-reasons. So it might as well be three. So there's two, two reasons why Moscow has to be transformed. The first reason has to do with international prestige. I'll comment on this map in a moment. For an, in the Enlightenment, of course, to be enlightened, to be European means to be enlightened. Um, but Russians were widely viewed as Muscovites. In fact, if you have a look at this map, this is a map from 1742. And at the top it says, Etat du Grand Duc de Moscovy. Right? These are the lands of the Grand Duke of Muscovy. So in 1742, this is just one example, you can find many of these. In 1742, Russia is still referred to as Muscovy. Right? To Westerners, Moscow and Russia are the same thing. Moscow was geographically on the border of Asia. That is, until the mid-18th century, it was assumed, or it was thought that the border of Asia was on the Don. And if you look at the map, the dawn roughly lines up in terms of latitude, latino longitude, with Moscow. So Moscow was already geographically thought to be on the boundary of Asia. And that was certainly the perception that Europeans had, that Moscow was a basically Asian place. And Europeans tended to think that Moscow was representative of Russia. For example, Casanova v visited there in the 1760s. And Casanova writes the following in his memoirs. One has not seen Russia if one has not seen Moscow. And whoever has known only the Russians of St. Petersburg does not know the Russians of the real Russia. The inhabitants of the new capital are viewed here in Moscow as foreigners. For a long time to come, the true capital of the Russians will be holy Moscow. Moscow clings to the past, city of traditions and memories, city of the Tsars. She is a daughter of Asia and most surprised to find herself in Europe. So one of, and, and this, this, some version of this is repeated by one European visitor after another, that St. Petersburg is window dressing. St. Petersburg is a, a stage set that's there to, to fool foreigners. If you really want to see what Russia is like, you have to go to Moscow. And as long as Moscow seems Asiatic, and that's the standard term for it, Russia is not a fully enlightened place. And if Russia is not an enlightened place, 
you have to wonder whether your king should form alliances with them, whether as a merchant you should do business with them, whether as a Western expert you should migrate there to take a job. So, so Moscow being perceived as non-European fundamentally damaged Russian foreign policy concerns. So that, that's one, so one concern, one reason to transform the place is foreign policy. The second reason is that Moscow was the hub of the Russian interior. I got this nifty little map from John Randolph. This shows uh, the, the major roads, as the postal roads of Russia in the early 18th century. You notice they all converge on Moscow. Right? Moscow is the hub of the Russian interior. St. Petersburg is off to the side. If you look at a map of the Russian river network, and of course the rivers are principal trade arteries, you would see the same thing. Moscow is at the center of everything. Moscow is the hub of the interior commercially. It was by far the biggest city in the 18th century, except for Petersburg. But Petersburg had a very peripheral location. I mean, you all may be familiar with this. The way Petersburg, the, you know, Petersburg got most of its grain from the Russian interior. But the way the grain got to St. Petersburg, I'm just giving this as an example of Petersburg's isolation, is the stuff was shipped from all sorts of points to the upper Volga, and then you had to load it into barges and travel something like a thousand miles of locks and canals and rapids and so forth. It's actually a dangerous odyssey to get all this grain from north of Moscow to St. Petersburg. So St. Petersburg is the window to, to Europe, but that meant in many ways it was geographically isolated from, from the remainder of Russia. So, and otherwise, there's no city in Russia that begins to compare with Moscow in significance. In addition, Moscow was the, aside from Petersburg, is the principal center of, of government. It was the principal center of, of culture. It had Russia's only university. And St. Petersburg at Moscow is also the place where the Tsars were crowned, where this is an engraving showing the, the announcement of the upcoming coronation of Catherine the Great. This is where the, each Tsar was crowned. And what that indicates is that the monarchs themselves recognized, recognized Moscow's centrality. That to most Russians, even to most Russians, Moscow was the capital more than St. Petersburg. So why does all this matter? There's why does it matter that Moscow is the center of things? And it matters at two levels. If you will, this is a good news, bad news story, right? The good news is that Moscow is a very promising laboratory for social engineering. If the Russian regime wanted to spread a version of European culture to a broader segment of Russian society, it meant that the Russian middle classes had to have contact with nobles, they had to have contact with foreigners, they had to be able to go to school, they had to be able to read books, they had to have access to the kinds of places where you learn an enlightened, enlightened manners and enlightened forms of sociability. That is, they had to have parks where they could promenade. They had to have coffee houses where they could sip coffee and read the newspaper. They had to, they had, to have access to Western consumer goods. So a, the, what, what you find in Moscow, Moscow had the critical mass where this was possible. Moscow was the one place where you could bring together lots of non-noble Russians, expose them to this culture, and they could export this to the Russian provinces. So people from Moscow would go back out to the provinces and they'd bring books, they'd bring you know, journals, they would bring Western clothes, they would introduce you know, all these kinds of things. And in fact, Diderot, or Diderot, who's one of Catherine's advisors, thought that, these were, that for exactly these reasons, the, the imperial capital should be moved back to Moscow. Or Diderot had nice ways of expressing to himself. He, of course, had to present his ideas to Catherine in a way that wouldn't annoy her. So he had to make it amusing. He points out to Catherine at one point uh, when he talks about St. Petersburg being the capital, that for a country to have the capital on its periphery was, quote, like an animal that has its stomach at the tip of its big toe. <laughs> or another point he says about the fact that, um, you know, Moscow, that St. Petersburg is the capital and not Moscow, he says to, he writes to Catherine, is it a matter of indifference that your majesty, who wants to be heard by her subjects, is preaching where her, your subjects are not? and is heard only through a speaking trumpet, and there was a thing you hold to your ear, is heard only through a speaking trumpet in the place where your subjects actually are. Right, that your subjects are in Moscow, and in the Russian heartland, that's where you as Tsar have to be. So on the one hand, the good news about Moscow's location is that you can reach the, the Russian heartland much more effectively than St. Petersburg. There's the, the bad news sign of the, sign of the bad news aspect of the same story, 
is that this concentration of traditional Russianness, of, of archaic, as Catherine saw it, Russianness in Moscow, represented a threat to the imperial state. You know, Catherine, as you know, comes to power in 1762. In 1771, there's a devastating plague epidemic in Moscow. 50,000 people died. And when the government tried to impose quarantine measures, which the government thought made sense from an enlightened perspective, when the government tried to impose these quarantine measure, measures in 1771, there was a mass revolt. Right? The people rioted. They, they stormed the, the, the Kremlin. They lynched the archbishop. A um, military force had to be used. A provincial merchant wrote at, at the time in his diary about the repression of this uprising. The army fired at the people with cannons, like at an enemy army. So, so Moscow, the sheer concentration of people embedded in traditional Russian culture, had the potential to create a tremendous disaster, like the plague revolt. Three years later, right, three years after the plague, it looked like Pugachev's army, right, Pugachev, the, you, know, you know, the big Pugachev you know, rebellion that originated in the, among the Cossacks in the southeast, Pugachev's army was headed in the direction of Moscow in 1774, and the nobles were widely convinced that the people of Moscow would rise up and greet Pugachev as a liberator. And once he had Moscow, then St. Petersburg was not safe anymore either. In 1812, the same crisis arises with Napoleon, that the Russian authorities were equally alarmed at the prospect uh, that the people of Moscow might rise up against the regime as Napoleon's army approached. So in other words, the massive concentration of people who were alien to the values of the imperial regime, the massive concentration of these people in Moscow was a, a permanent security threat to the survival of the imperial regime. So these are the reasons for undertaking the transformation. There's on the one hand wanting to build international prestige, and on the other hand wanting to turn a, a hotbed of uh, essentially of uh, or uh, to transform the biggest city of the interior into a place that would support the regime's values. So like I was saying at the beginning, beginning with Catherine, there's this three-pronged approach to, to bringing about this transformation. The first prong of this is what I was calling the imperial social project. That is to try, try to create a middle, what Catherine calls a middle estate or a middle sort of people, a middling sort, who would be a distinct social stratum that would endorse the values of the regime and that would spread those values to wider population groups. Catherine's approach to doing this, and this, this is a complicated topic and I'm only going to touch on it fairly briefly, Catherine's approach to this is primarily to tinker with the estate system. As you know, every Russian subject belo legally belonged to an estate, a seslovia. Which estate you belonged to was determined by law, and that determined the rights and duties that you had. What Catherine does is she takes, oh, well, let me skip over this, takes several estates, that is the estates, if you look at nobles, right, this, this little pie chart there, shows the estate makeup of Moscow. That's what share of the population belong to what estates. As you'll notice, most people were house serfs, peasant serfs, and state peasants. Right, that's, that's these ones. But of the remainder, there are nobles, and most nobles were not big time serf owners. Most nobles were actually petty civil servants. Right, middle class types more than upper class types. There's nobles, there's the clergy, there's merchants, and there's people called townspeople. Those are the basic groups that Catherine lumps, you know, groups together under this, this heading of a middle estate. The one subcategory that wouldn't belong to that are wealthy hereditary nobles who are serf owners. Those are a different group. But what Catherine does is with all of these groups, she divides them into two basic categories. One category is people who are freed from certain indignities. Right? Russian, most Russians were subject to brutal corporal punishment by the police, if the police saw a reason for it. Most people were subject to the possibility of conscription, which in the 18th century meant cons military conscription for life. And most people were subject to the head tax. And if you were subject to the head tax, that meant that your life in many ways was controlled by the community that, by the community that you lived in, because the community was jointly responsible for for allocating the taxes. So Catherine's approach is to offer cert an elite of the clergy, an elite of the merchants, and the lesser civil servants. Catherine offers them exemption from these 
burdens. And the idea is by giving the, by exempting them from this, she's giving them a degree of personal dignity, of personal security, and of individual autonomy that they would not have had otherwise. Um, a larger group, right, so that's a minority. For example, the priests are given these rights, but the sacristans are not. The wealthier merchants get these rights, the poor ones don't. Um, in government offices, government officials who, are, who have a rank on the table of ranks get this right because they're personal nobles. Officials who do not have a status on the table of ranks, who are clerks, they do not get these rights. So within each of these groups, civil servants, merchants, clergy, there is a higher group that is given these rights. The lower group does, group does not have them, but they can earn them. So if you're a clerk and you can work your way up to a, an office on the table of ranks, then you acquire these exemptions. If, you, if you're the son of a sacristan, but you become a priest, then you get these rights, even though your father, the sacristan, didn't. So the idea here is to encourage, a significant, is to encourage these middle groups to be successful at their professions, in their careers, or in their educations, so that they can rise into, into a higher category where they will get rights that other people don't have. And this will give them a commitment to the stability of the regime, because the regime is offering them these opportunities. So, so the one prong of Catherine's strategy, then, is, to, is this imperial social project, is shaping this, this urban middling sort. The second prong of her strategy is to reconstruct Moscow's urban environment. The problem here with the urban environment is most of Moscow looked like this. Right, this, is, this is the city wall. When you approach the city from the countryside, this is what you can see. Um, if you don't mind, I might turn the lights down just a little bit so this is up, so this is more easily visible, except does this? If you can figure out how to turn off the fluorescent lights, that'd be great. Um, now, what you'll notice is the, the, the city gate is an impressive neoclassical structure. Behind that, all you have is wooden, is wooden huts. And frankly, an awful lot of Moscow was like that. Right? A lot of Moscow was, um, was wooden houses that were fairly primitive. Down, mm -hmm. Moscow did not have a compact, you know, neoclassical, impressive downtown that looked impressive the way a large Western city did, or the way St. Petersburg did. In fact, if you look at, this is a map of Moscow. You see, and this is in the early 19th century, after a lot of reconstruction, much of the outskirts, like here, is woods. A, a lot of this green and brown stuff on the outskirts, as forests, fields, meadows. A lot, of the outs a lot of Moscow actually had a village kind of feel to it. Um, this is a problem at a couple of levels. First of all, it's, psychologically, it does not train you to think of yourself as a, an urban European. Moreover, what it does is it isolates the, 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 the middle class that Catherine is trying to develop. It isolates them from the places of sociability where they could learn the habits of the higher classes. Because what you find in Moscow, for example, this is, this is the boulevard. This is what's today Tverskoy Boulevard. Back then it was just the, the boulevard as it appeared in the 19th century. Before the boulevard was built, there was no place in the center of the city where you could go for an elegant stroll. There were virtually no theaters. There were virtually no restaurants. The way these things worked in Moscow is that the kinds of public, the kinds of genteel public entertainments that in Western cities were often available on a public basis, that you could go to a theater if you bought a ticket. In Moscow, a lot of this was available only in the private homes of the nobility. The problem with that is the nobility tended to cluster at the edge of the city. So that if you lived, if you were a middle class person and lived in the city, you had no way to get there. In fact, let me read you just a, a this is a quotation from 1870, right? So this is 100 years after Catherine. This is a German, vi a German visitor who described his impression of Moscow. And he notes how the upper classes all cluster in the suburbs. He writes, the very streets where high society lives are neither paved nor equipped with sidewalks, and are covered in winter with knee-deep snow, and in spring and fall with as much mud. And so a cultivated person can only frequent the better circles in Moscow if he disposes of a carriage. And this makes life in Moscow very expensive. Now, Moscow was much bigger than most Western cities. Right? It was far bigger spatially, for example, than Paris, even though Paris had probably two or three times the population. 
So Moscow is very spread out and a little bit like in a lot of American metro areas today. If you don't have a car, you're very isolated. In Moscow, if you weren't rich enough to afford your own carriage, you were isolated. And Moscow in the late 18th century had 50,000 horses for a population of 200,000 people. And a lot of those horses, of course, are not used for passenger transport. So most people had to walk. I love this picture. This is from the late 19th century, but it, and it depicts the, the 17th century, but the 18th century still looked like this. Right? This is what the city would have looked like on a rainy day. And you see these people wading through knee-deep mud. And in fact, the fact that they're painting this picture in the late 19th century shows how powerful this memory was of Moscow as a muddy place where it's hard to get around. Imagine that you are a person of the middle classes, and you want to go out in the evening, because you work during the day. You want to go out in the evening to a place where you, can, where you would learn the habits of Western gentility, to a theater, to a reception. You know, you would, the city is pitch dark. You have to walk long distances. In the summer, or you're walking through the rain or through the mud. Um, this is what much of Moscow still looked like in the 19th century. You notice these wooden, this is at the edge of the city, there's a city gate, kind of like what we saw before. This is the edge of the city, you notice, you know, no light, except for the little bit of light that's coming out of this window, there's nobody out. You'd be walking long distances through empty streets, um, bumping into all kinds of shady characters. There's no police. Instead, in the 18th century, what happened is the authorities put up checkpoints at night in the streets and stopped anyone trying to go by. And if they weren't satisfied with your reasons, then you were stopped. And so for most people, it was very unattractive to go out at night. And that meant either at night you stayed home, and by staying at home, you, you essentially remained in a pre-Westernized cultural environment. Or if you went out, it was for behaviors that also undermined the, the, the goals of gentility that the regime wants to encourage. So young men would go out for heavy drinking. Women might go out for prostitution. But you couldn't go out to take part in the kind of sociability that would socialize you into the culture that the regime wants to encourage. So Catherine, try, tr Catherine transforms this. Right? Catherine and her successors undertake a range of reforms here. F they try to change the city visually. There's a lot of impressive neoclassical architecture that gets put up. I'm putting up the Pashkov house here in downtown Moscow as one example. But downtown Moscow gets reconstructed to look more like an impressive Western city. In fact, as you might know, Catherine had plans to demolish the Kremlin. Right, this was, they wanted to keep the, these were the cathedrals. They wanted to keep the cathedrals and a handful of other buildings, but otherwise <coughs> you'd create a totally new neoclassical palace complex that was going to be much bigger than Versailles. And that was going to symbolize the, this enlightened metropolis that Catherine wanted to build. This eventually fell through for reasons that are unclear. Um, there's a, a systematic attempt to get rid of nasty smells from downtown. Slaughterhouses had to be moved out of the city. Cemeteries had to be moved out of the city. Catherine builds an aqueduct to try to pipe water into the city so people had access to water. The way this worked is water was supposed to be pumped into big public reservoirs and then you would collect the water from there. So Catherine tries to transform the, the, infra the physical infrastructure of the city. Um, she and her successors build public spaces where the middle classes can promenade in a genteel fashion, such as the boulevard, or such as the Kremlin Gardens, which of course are still there today. She also tries to open up the, the access to the city after dark. And I would want to stress the importance of, the, of nighttime, because again, the middle classes are people who work. The only time that they can go out to take part in any larger social life is after dark. So Catherine establishes a police force. Policemen all over Moscow, this is dim to see here, little guard houses get built like this one. Each guard house is manned by a couple of police officers. And these officers' job is not to stop people from circulating, it's to maintain public safety. And the, the watchmen who man these things tended to be army veterans. So these are not trained policemen anyway. These are army veterans who weren't physically fit enough for active service. And I'll come back to that. In addition, street lights are put up. So Moscow, in, in 1766, right, 1766, Moscow has 600 street lights, right? 600 in 1766. By 1801, there's 7,000. So there's a significant effort to try to pre create some light. 
Um, in fact, right here, you see this, there's a lamp lighter who's climbing up because there's a light, there's a lantern right next to the street light. These lights are not terribly bright, but they're enough that at night you could see a, a lighted point and would know, okay, that's the direction I have to go. Um, this had a big impact. I mean, in the late 19th century, there's a, a Moscow merchant's son by the name of Nikolai Vishnyakov. And Vishnyakov writes his memoirs about growing up in Moscow in the years before the great reforms. And at one point, Vishnyakov tries to imagine what life was like for his father, who had grown up in the late 18th century. Right? The father was much older than Vishnyakov himself. And Vishnyakov imagines the position of his father, who was a child under Paul I. And there's a moment under Paul I when restrictions on nighttime movement around the city were reimposed. And Vishnyakov writes, my father saw with his own eyes how Moscow became virtually lifeless at night, how gates were closed toward evening and locked with sturdy bolts, how barriers were erected in the streets to block the passage of peaceful people. There was no staying out late or getting lost in conversation and acquaintances. All at the appointed hour, you had to rush home and sit as though under siege. So you, you get an impression there of what, how opening up the city at night by having police, by having lights, how that cr gives m people of middling status an opportunity for a more complex, more fulfilling personal life. What all of this does is it makes Moscow by the early 19th century much more similar to major cities of the West. So if you look, if you compare Moscow with Paris or London or Berlin by 1800, there, I don't think there's a fundamental qualitative difference with regard to security in the streets, with regard to the availability of street lights, the ability of people to move around at night. Uh, this, is a, a, this is what Tverskaya Ulitsa looks like by the early 19th century. Streets like that could easily be compared to the major avenues of, of Western cities. Now, Catherine's the third prong of her strategy that I was talking about is to rebrand Moscow. He has to give Moscow a different image. And the creation of this new image begins in the mid to late 18th century. Um, let me skip over this map, unfortunately, although it's a very nice map. But let me point to this map right here. This is the first modern map that gets printed of Moscow. It was made in 1739. And the, what is interesting about, many things are interesting about this map. One thing I want to draw your attention to is the map shows things that are there. It also shows things that are planned. So the, if you look at this map, you get a sense simultaneously of what the city actually is and how the regime wants the city to become. The same thing happens with the development of statistics. Statistics get published for the first time in a significant measure in the later 18th century. Let me skip over this. If you have a look at, this is from a book from 1782, the Statistical Survey of Moscow. The whole by a guy named Ruban, the entire book looks like this. What you, you have, the, Ruban goes district by district, describes these districts. What this page on the left shows is streets, right? So on the left you have Bajshia Ulitsa, that is real streets. On the right you have Piriulki, those are lanes. Streets and lanes were urban planning designations. That is a street and, a, a, you know, there are different building codes for streets and lanes. So by describing Moscow as having so many streets and so many lanes, what, what Ruban is telling you, he's both describing the reality and describing the planning, and he's mixing up the two. So you get the sense that what the regime is planning is already there. In the same way, he breaks down this, the population into nobles, clergy, razachinsi, merchants, and so forth. These also are government categories that are designed to guide the development of society. So essentially, what you see on both the maps and in the statistics is the tendency is not to distinguish between the actual reality that exists on the ground and the reality that the regime is hoping to create. And you come away with the impression that the, re that the goal is already there. It's a little bit like socialist realism in that way. If you look at the literature about Moscow in the 18th century, it's the same story. There's the one exception to, my, to the pattern is the novel, the, the, the Adventures of Vanka Kain. Right? Vanka Kain was an 18th century gangster kingpin in Moscow. And this is, Vanka Kain is a, is a picaresque story about the Moscow underworld. But that's entirely highly unusual. The much more typical pattern of the writing about Moscow that develops, and the works of Karamzin are an example of this, the typical pattern is not to represent the city as a complex, ambiguous, tension-ridden, 
urban environment. The typical pattern is, first of all, not to write about typically urban classes at all. But if you read Karam, like Karamzin's short story, Poor Lisa, for example, is about nobles and peasants. It's just set in the city. And in addition, there's a tendency to describe the city in idealizing ways. So, so, the, so, if you, so by the end of the 18th century, if you looked at the maps, if you looked at the statistics, if you read the, the, the writings about the city, you would not come away with the impression that this is a complex, dynamic, ambiguous social organism. You would come away with the impression that the, the categories that the government used to, to plan urban development are in fact the categories that explain how the city works and that the reality lines up with these conceptual categories. If you look at early paintings of Moscow, it's the same story. The first significant painter of cityscapes in Moscow, let me get a different picture that's better. The first signif significant painter of cityscapes in Moscow was Fyodor Alexeyev. I'm going to turn the lights down even more so you can see this better. Um, at least I'm trying. Okay, this is Alexeyev's painting of one section of downtown Moscow. You have grand historic buildings to show Moscow's historic significance. You have small, peaceful groups of people. Each group is clearly recognizable by their clothing in terms of belonging to a certain class. Here on the bottom left, you have the lamplighter who shows how Moscow is becoming a, a lighted up city. The street is paved. In the background, there's a police guard house. There's an army unit practicing. So uh, essentially, all the units of the regime's creation of the imperial social project, they're all there. But there, there's no particular interest, again, in the social complexity of the big city, which is an interest that you would have found if you had looked in contemporary, contemporaneous writings and paintings and so forth of Western cities. So what happens by the, by the era of Alexander I, you have this, this, this transformation of Moscow's underway, right? The imperial social project is creating a middling class of people who are going to school, who are wearing Western clothes, who are absorbing aspect of the genteel culture of the elites. And the urban environment is being transformed. And an image of the city is being created that demonstrates that Moscow is, in fact, the enlightened metropolis that the regime wants to create. So what happens by the time of Nicholas I? And I'm going to skip over something just because otherwise I will run out of time. The first thing is, in terms of the imperial social project, let me just skip over this. In terms of the imperial social project, essentially, this becomes, the, the, the Catherine's policy was based on, on giving sp specific opportunities to particular estates. So sons of the clergy go to church schools, right? Sons of nobles go, or daughters of nobles go to either private schools or military schools. By, in, by the period of Nicholas I, this approach begins to show serious limitations. And education is a good example. What you see in the educational field is by the 1830s and 40s, the groups that Catherine had targeted mostly were going to school and becoming literate. The issue by then is if you want to use the middle class as a, as a starting point for spreading the imperial culture to the wider people, at that point, what's needed is a system of, 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 public, of popular education, not a system of estate-specific education. And that leap from, from estate-specific schools to schools for the general population, that leap is not made. In a broader sense, you could argue, if you look at the, the, the social groups of Russia under Nicholas I, that the, that the different estate groups, the nobles, the clergy, the merchants, each develop their own subculture, they don't really come together to form a unified group, and that means that they have difficulty spreading their culture to the wider population. So what happens by Nicholas I, in terms of creating this new middle, middle stratum, is Catherine's policy had reached the limits of its potential, and it is not taken to the next step. You find the same thing with the transformation of Russia's infrastructure. Right, Moscow, in, it, every city, every major city in Europe faced the same problems that Moscow did, which is rapid population growth and increasing pressure on the, the urban infrastructure. But Moscow generally retains the infrastructure created by Catherine. So for example, if you look at the development of the police, right, the traditional phenomenon in Russia and in Western Europe was to have policemen who were, who were watchmen, who had no particular training, weren't well paid, were not really professional police. 
London in 1829 creates a modern police force, as we would understand the term today. Paris does the same thing in the 1850s. In Moscow, not only do they still stay with watchmen, whose only qualification is that they, they're too old to serve in the army, they don't, the guys, the, the, the size of the, the police force doesn't get expanded. They don't even get a pay raise from the 1820s to the 1860s. So Catherine's police force by the 1850s and 60s looks utterly archaic. The same is true with the streetlights. Right? The streetlights, look at these developments on about streetlights. Moscow operated with streetlights that, that burned hemp seed, which is fairly dim. We see the growth in numbers. Rapid jumps from 1766 to 82 to 1801, and then it stays the same. From 1801 to 1850, virtually no increase and no technological improvement. London started with about 1,000 oil lamps in, in the 1730s. That's not much different from Moscow. By 1823, they had 40,000 gas lamps. I mean, you can see how Moscow was falling behind because it continued to operate the way that it operated under Catherine. You find the same thing with the water supply. This is the, now, Catherine had built an aqueduct, so she had pioneered bringing in water to the city. But look at the average number of liters per person in the 1830s and early 40s that were being pumped into the city. Right? From the best information I found is Paris about 100, New York about 400, Moscow 7. And, that's not, and Moscow had already had the same seven decades earlier, and at that time that was state of the art. But the next push of modernization does not happen. So in other words, the imperial social project goes into a phase of stagnation, and the urban renewal goes into a phase of stagnation. What happens at the same time, and this is where the entire policy backfires on the regime, what happens is that the image of Moscow continues to be transformed. What transforms it is, the, is an influx of new literary currents from the West. I'm going to skip over Mr. Zagoskin here for a moment and go to statistics. What happens in the 1830s and 40s is rapid urban growth in Western countries, especially in Britain and France. And the consequence is that British and French social observers develop new ways of thinking about urban life. And they develop new conceptual tools that the Russians then adopt. So the Rus so educated Russians begin looking at Russian cities, and Moscow in particular, in the way that educated British and French observers look at London and Paris. And the accomplishments of the Russian regime look increasingly weak when seen through that prism. There's two particular developments that arrive in Russia. One is quantitative social analysis. That is the use of statistics for social analysis. Now remember, I was saying before in the 18th century, the, the statistics that get published are statistics that reflect the planning categories of the regime. Right? The regime wants to foster certain social estates, so they publish how many people belong to those estates. The, the, old, the 18th century approach to statistics is that government statistics are there to measure the implementation of government policies. So for example, merchants have to pay certain taxes, so we have to count how many merchants there are so we know who has to pay what in taxes. Right? That's the 18th century approach to statistics. The 19th, the, the 19th century approach, inspired by Adam Smith, is that statistics are there to identify what's actually going on in society. Where what the forces are that are shaping society. And so, for example, this is, these are statistics released by the Moscow chief of police. They're suddenly counting you know, how many people go to different public entertainments, how many people died of different causes, and for what reasons. And the consequence of this new approach to statistics is to make the social processes in Moscow look much more opaque than they had been before. It looks much more opaque and much less like it's under government control. Now, occasionally, government propaganda tries to get around this. And I'll try to wrap this up in just a few minutes. The government propaganda tries to neutralize this effect. For example, the, the Moscow chief of police in 1847 announces that on average last year, the, average, you know, the, av the population of, Mos of Moscow went to the Banya on average 10 times a year. That is, each person went on average 10 times a year. And that proves that of all European peoples, only the Russians care about cleanliness. Right, so you get these very clumsy attempts to use these statistics to, in the interest of government propaganda, but the statistics themselves undermine the sense that the government's policies allow us to shape and understand the city. The second big development is what's called the physiological sketch. The physiological sketch is a, type, is a literary genre in which you write an often humorous or sentimental story about an individual 
where that individual is supposed to be representative of a social type. So you, you might get, so for example, one of the most famous, an early famous one is about the water carrier, right, the, vada, the vada vos, this guy whose job it is to collect water at the big public reservoir and haul it out to people's homes. And so the story describes the, the, the trials and tribulations of, of this man's life. The, in a lot of these Russian physiological sketches were politically very harmless. You know, these are not brutal, aggressive social criticisms most of the time. But the trouble is that the categories that they use do not match the government's categories either. That is, the water carrier, for example, is not a legal category that the government created. It's not, it's not like the 18th century categories where merchants and, and nobles are legal categories. This is somebody trying to understand the dynamics of society. And so essentially what happens, and I want to wrap this up, is both the statistics, and both the, the new use of statistics and the new kind of the social journalism, the effect that those have is to create a sense that the city is a much more complex, much more opaque, fluid, dynamic place than what, than, than what the regime would like it to be. And th therefore, by implication, the regime's policies do not have the ability to shape urban life and they don't even help us understand urban life the way it was represented in the 18th century. At the same time, these approaches draw attention to all the flaws of the imperial social system. So they draw attention to the, f they, so there's increasing attention to the fact that they have gas lights in London and not in, in Moscow, that they have a better water supply in, in Paris that they do in Moscow. So this awareness of, the awareness of Russian urban problems grows by the middle of the 18th century at the same time, and here I'm getting to my very end, at the same time what happens is this Russian middle class that Catherine and her successors wanted to foster, this middle class comes into being. You have, by the mid-19th mid century, a stratum of educated Russians who write for newspapers and who read books and who are critical social thinkers, and none of whom remember the time before Catherine. So for all of them, the really old days are Catherine's time. And because that's what their grandparents have told them about. I mean, if you think in terms of age, right, in 1850, you don't remember things from before 1770. So what they know is we live in a place that's kind of decrepit, you know, compared with what they have in London and Paris. And this is the place that Catherine and her successors gave us. And obviously, Catherine and her successors were not very effective at building a modern city. And as a result, they don't remember the time before Catherine, so they don't remember that this was all revolutionary in its time. And they don't see their own existence as a group as a sign of, as an accomplishment of the regime. And so in that way, the attempt to create an enlightened, an enlightened metropolis in some ways is successful because a lot is achieved, but politically it backfires on the regime because it creates this whole educated middle stratum that decides that the regime has been very ineffective. I suspect, and I'll, I'll conclude on this note, that one could tell a similar story about the development of the Soviet Union from the 1920s to the 1970s and 80s, but I'll leave that to people who know more about the Soviet topic than I do. Thank you very much.